So if markets aren't great for um, governing public sector organizations and these other like repugnant goods and merit goods, what can we use them for? Are they even useful? And the answer is yes, they're useful. Um, but only in certain circumstances. Um, so at, in the last session, we talked about this idea of the invisible hand and how as people are kind of bumping into each other and interacting in society, um, they generally settle on some sort of price, um, regardless of like, there's no like ministry of Skittles again, um, but CVS and Walmart and, and Kroger and Costco all kind of settle on a price of Skittles just naturally. Um, because these market institutions work really well in those types of situations where there is buying and selling. Um, in situations where there is no buying and selling, markets, not great. But when there is buying and selling, that's why markets were invented. That's why they emerged as an institution for governing this stuff. Um, so there are good situations um, for markets. Um, so they are really good at producing, distributing goods and services. Um, again, because that's what they were designed to do. Um, they're also really, really good at allowing for specialization, where um, if you have a bunch of people um, out in the middle of nowhere, just kind of all producing everything, so a whole bunch of farmers that all produce their own eggs and milk and cheese and wheat and corn and everything, um, they're going to spend a lot of time doing all of that stuff. But if they could get together and say, one of them is really good at cows, one of them is really good at wheat, one is really good at corn, and then they decide to specialize, then they can have really efficient dairy farms and really efficient corn farms and wheat farms. And then they can trade amongst themselves and get a lot more than what they could do if they were just working individually. Um, and that's because there are all sorts of gains that we can get when we specialize in something and then when we trade in something. Um, in the example today, we're going to talk about um, two general principles for this, and we're going to illustrate it with some graphs and hopefully help you understand like why countries should trade with each other and why individuals should trade with each other and why you shouldn't just kind of do everything on your own because it's not as efficient. Um, so one of these concepts we'll talk about when we get to the example later um, is this idea of comparative advantage, which is where the opportunity cost is lower than the other parties. Don't worry about that phrase, opportunity cost. We're going to get to it um, in a few sessions from now. Really quick definition is that it, it just means the cost of not doing the thing that you're doing. So if you're, if you have, if you're growing corn, um, you're giving up the ability to do something else, to raise cows or grow wheat. And so those cows that you're foregoing because you're growing corn, that is the opportunity cost. It's, it's the, the cost of the other thing that you could be doing. And so when you have comparative advantage, it could like if one of the parties is giving up less stuff to do something and specialize in something, then that means they have comparative advantage. Absolute advantage means um, the cost is generally lower for one party in total, not considering opportunity cost. And if that sounds confusing, don't worry. Um, when we go, if you go to the example page for absolute and comparative advantage, um, you'll see there's a whole worked out example there um, showing the difference between comparative advantage and absolute advantage. And I walk through an example of how to figure out which two parties in a transaction have comparative advantage and absolute advantage. So what you really need to know for this at this point is that um, if two people are trading with each other and they're really good at each of their respective things, then the world is better off having them specialize in those things. Um, and you can actually create more stuff, um, more wheat and more milk than you could if they each did like a little bit of wheat and a little bit of milk on their own. It expands the possibility of, of creating stuff. So that's, um, that's kind of the main conceptual thing you need to know about this, this gains of trade idea is you get all sorts of expanded possibilities when these two parties actually trade and specialize with each other. Um, one issue with that, though, is you have this idea of fairness. And we'll talk about this more in the next couple sessions, um, this idea of fairness, where sometimes if you are kind of a more powerful country, you can force um, less powerful countries to produce stuff for you at cheaper prices and potentially take advantage of them. Um, we see this with um, sweatshops and all sorts of um, factories with near slave labor, or actual slave labor, if you're in the Gulf, for, uh, in the Persian Gulf, for instance, um, where it's easy to take advantage of people who have less power than you um, to take advantage of their specialization, and then you gain even more. So it expands the possibilities by a ton, but at 
the cost of, of taking advantage of other countries and people. So um, there are dangers to this. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that again with the example um, in graph form. So markets are great at allowing for specialization, um, expands what you can actually get from, um, from producing stuff. They're really good at distributing goods and services. That's kind of their main job. But the other magical thing that prices do is, or that markets do, is they can use prices to send signals about the thing that exists. And we talked about this already with the, the Skittles idea, where there's no central list of prices for all Skittles in the country. Um, you just kind of figure out the price by setting it somewhere. And if it's too high, not enough people are going to buy it. And so you have to lower it. And if it's too low, you'll run out really fast. So you have to raise it. And so figuring out that price, you just kind of fall into it. Um, and as a buyer, if you go to, um, to CVS and decide to buy a bag of Skittles and you notice that the price is like twice as expensive, you'll probably think that maybe there's something weird with like the high fructose corn syrup market and maybe there's a drought somewhere. Um, you don't have to read the news to figure out if there really is a drought. You just kind of figure it out because the price is high and that's weird. Um, but it provides you with extra information that's encoded in that price. And that's kind of this magical thing about prices. Um, so from your reading, there was this sentence there that said that when markets work well, prices send, send messages about the real scarcity of goods and services. So again, like if the price of Skittles doubles, then we see there's probably something wrong with the Skittles market. If the price of Skittles goes like in half, then you can probably assume that there's too much corn and they're trying to get rid of high fructose corn syrup. So they're ramping up production of Skittles to offload them. Um, and so like just paying attention to what prices are saying kind of tells you what's going on in the world and how much stuff there is in the world. Um, at the same time, it coordinates how much people, how much stuff people buy. They don't have to send out an edict from the Ministry of Skittles that says everybody must go buy 10 extra packages of Skittles because there's an excess in corn. Um, all they have to do is lower the prices and people respond naturally. And that's this invisible hand idea where we don't have to coordinate with each other. Um, we just all kind of look at the prices of stuff and then react accordingly. Um, this idea of having prices be kind of messages of scarcity was invented by this guy here named Friedrich Hayek. Um, he's a libertarian hero nowadays. Um, he's from what is called the Austrian School of Economics. And libertarian economists love this guy um, because um, his whole thing was the government should not get involved in prices at all because prices without any external interve intervention are all you need to be involved in the economy and to buy stuff. And then if the government gets involved at all, it's gonna make it's gonna mess stuff up. So his general argument here is that we all make decisions based on some sort of information. We go to the store, we look at the price of stuff, and we figure out kind of how how the price of bananas or Skittles or whatever fits in our budget. And so we have information out in the world. Markets, as people are interacting with each other and doing the whole invisible hand thing, um, produce prices, and prices guide our decisions. The prices help determine what we buy and what we don't buy. And so as long as we have good information from good prices that are set kind of well through this whole invisible hand thing, then the prices that we see um, are accurate and we don't actually need to pay attention to all the global trends out in the world. Um, so if we notice that prices are high in Skittles, then we're not going to buy as much. We don't need to watch the news and anticipate um, corn shortages because of a drought in Nebraska. Um, we just kind of figure out that there might be something wrong, or maybe we don't even care that something might be wrong with the corn market. We're just not going to buy more corn products because the, um, because the prices are too expensive. And so that's all we really need to know is just prices. And so th this whole Friedrich Hayek idea is that prices are all that you need to know to take action in the economy. You don't need to research a ton of stuff. You don't even need to know like growing seasons of things. You just pay attention to the prices. And if things are really expensive, it's probably out of season. And if things are cheap, it's probably in season. And that's all you really need to know. You don't have to be an expert farmer um, to buy produce. You just look at the price. Um, so they signal all sorts of things. They shape what we consume. So this is the idea of seasonal fruit here. Um, I have no idea when like blueberry and blackberry season is. I've, I'm not a farmer at all. We have a garden in our front yard here and it has like um, one flower after we planted like dozens and dozens and they all died. Um, we planted some 
peas and we have nothing like I'd be a pathetically like dead starving farmer if I had to do that. Um, the only way I know what season it is for fruit is because I go to Costco and raspberries are on sale and I'm like, oh, cool, it must be raspberry season. And so I buy them. Um, but I don't try to buy raspberries in November because I'm assuming that is not raspberry season. I know nothing about raspberry season, but I know prices and that's all I need to know. Um, with oil and gas, there's all the oil prices are influenced by a whole bunch of things. When there's global unrest, especially in the Middle East, oil prices will rise. Um, I don't need to watch the news every night to determine if I need to go buy gas the next day. Um, I just go pay attention to the prices and like casually look out the window and say, oh, prices are high, something's happening. Um, and that's all I need to know and I can still get involved in like buying gas, um, but I don't have to be an expert in global trends. Um, and so um, having those prices shapes what we consume. Um, I, we buy less gas when there is global instability. Um, we buy more gas when there isn't. Um, we buy more fruit when it's fruit season. We buy less when it's not, but it's not because we're experts. It's just because prices tell us to do that. Um, prices also shape what companies produce and kind of innovations in things. Um, the example from your reading was this idea from the, the, from the Civil War. There is a blockade um, from the Union on the South. Um, because the South produced most of the world's cotton at that point in the 1860s, but this blockade stopped the South from exporting most of their cotton. And so in Britain, which relied heavily on, on cotton from the United States South, um, because they had all like the whole cotton industry creating all sorts of textiles, they were unable to get Southern cotton. And so instead, um, they shifted their whole production line to um, Egyptian cotton and Indian cotton. Um, and they did that not because they were paying like very close attention to everything that like all the battles in the South. Um, each of these individual like textile firms that, that operated in like Liverpool and whatever, they weren't watching every Civil War battle. They were just saying, oh, it's getting more expensive. Let's start getting cotton from other places and ramping up production in Cairo or somewhere in India. And so as a result, they were able to shift their whole production line from the United States to um, Middle East and Southern Asia or Southeast Asia. Um, and but again, all they based that information on was just prices. And they may have seen different blockades in the news, but um, they weren't really paying super close attention because they didn't need to. Um, and so it kind of drove changes in production and, and created more innovation. And we also see this with um, food today. Um, so I already mentioned with high fructose corn syrup here, um, that's one of the main ingredients in, in candy. Um, and so Skittles is heavily based on high fructose corn syrup. And so when there's excess corn um, from the Midwest, like in Nebraska and Iowa, then often candy prices will be lower because um, there's an excess of high fructose corn syrup. And that's one way to offload it is to, to lower the prices of candy, produce more candy. Um, and that naturally lowers the prices. And so people will buy more. McRibs from McDonald's, um, that's kind of this, this weird food. I've never actually had it. I'm terrified of it. Um, but people apparently love it and they market it like every six months or so they say the McRib is back and it like people get really excited and go buy McRibs. Um, they actually plan McRibs um, around the pork market and they notice that when there's like an excess supply of pigs then pork prices start dropping and so McDonald's is able to come in and buy up a whole bunch of really cheap pork and then make a whole bunch of McRibs and sell those and then as soon as the pork market kind of restabilizes and gets back up to regular levels of pigs the McRib goes away. It follows closely the the whole pattern of, of pork supply in the United States. And so McDonald's has tooled its whole system around or its whole marketing system for the McRib around the pig population in the United States. Um, again, they're not paying super close attention to how many pigs there are. They don't have like counters in every single pig farm. They just pay attention to pig prices and then make decisions based on the prices. Um, Little Caesars does the same thing, but with cheese. So if you notice in the past year, um, if you buy Little Caesars pizza, which I do all the time because it's the cheapest for like lots of kids who don't care about taste, um, they invented a new pizza called the Extra Most Bestest Cheese Pizza and Extra Most Bestest Pepperoni Pizza. And it's like a dollar more expensive than the regular pizza. And it just has like twice the amount of cheese on it. It's just super cheesy pizza. 
And part of the reason they did this is because there was an excess in the cheese supply in the United States. There was too much cheese um, and not enough companies were using up the cheese. And so um, the price of cheese started dropping. And so that made it so that Little Caesars and other companies started sticking cheese in everything. Um, I think it was the summer of 2018, um, McDonald's starting, started selling like cheese fries and cheese hash browns and like putting cheese on everything um, as kind of this retro fun thing, like everybody have cheese fries. But that was also like at the same time as this cheese excess and they were just trying to get rid of, of cheese and, and trying to sell it off um, because the price of cheese was low. And so they were able to do that and take advantage of the low prices. And so these prices, um, again, McDonald's might have like experts tracking agricultural trends and stuff, but also um, they just kind of pay attention to what the price of things are. Again, that's all you need to know to get involved in a market. And that's this, this magic of the price. Um, how should prices be set? Um, this is where um, different um, economic philosophers start diverging. Um, according to Friedrich Hayek, um, prices should just be set on their own as people just bump into each other and you have supply and demand meeting and invisible hand tells the world what the price should be. But often you want to make it so that people have access to things, um, even like if things are way too expensive, you want to kind of limit um, the prices potentially. Um, when there is like a hurricane, there are laws against um, price gouging. Um, and charging triple or quadruple the price for like plywood to put on the outside of your house. Um, during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, there were um, laws um, and regulations that limited the price of personal protective equipment. And the government didn't want people um, charging $100 for an N95 mask because like that starts getting into immoral, repugnant market land. Um, and so once governments start doing that and setting price ceilings where you can't go beyond a certain price or price floors where it's a minimum price, then that starts messing with prices, which means it starts messing with um, the information that people look at. And so if prices are systematically wrong, um, either because monopolies make them higher or governments make them lower or governments make them higher, then people start behaving differently. If N95 masks are cheap because the government says they have to be cheap, then what happens is people start stockpiling them because they're out there. Um, there was a fascinating New York Times article about this guy that like went out and bought thousands and thousands of N95 masks and stored them in his house and then he was selling them on eBay. And then he like talked to the New York Times about it and the next day like the police came and raided his place and took like confiscated all of his masks to give to the hospitals and stuff because he was hoarding like critical equipment. Um, but the reason he did that is because the prices were low and so that was a signal to buy lots of them. Um, and so if prices are systematically wrong for whatever reason, then it messes up the behavior of people who want the stuff. And that's where um, markets start getting kind of wobbly and, and, and messed up. So the official term for this wobbliness and messed upness is a market failure which is basically just when prices do not capture the effects of indi individual actions, that is an example of market failure. And there's a whole bunch of market failures here. Um, these are the main ones that we're going to be talking about later in the semester, in the, in the last third of the class. Before we get to these, we do need to cover kind of the general economic principles of like how to draw supply curves and demand curves, and we'll, we'll get to that point. Um, so don't worry we will cover all of this stuff and it will make a lot more sense. Um, but generally these types of things are instances where prices get messed up and then markets accordingly get messed up. Um, and it's often in the case of monopolies, for instance, prices get messed up because individual firms are um, kind of engaging in, in monopolistic behavior and artificially raising their prices. In the world of externalities and public goods, it's often like government trying to stop bad things from happening or trying to provide public goods that aren't going to be provided by the market. And so once you start doing that, it messes up with prices and then does weird things to the market. And so we will quantify what this weird stuff is um, later in the semester, but just know that these are kind of what market failures are. It's when prices don't reflect reality um, and it starts messing, messing up with, with general markets and makes things too expensive or too cheap or too much stuff or too little stuff. Um, so those are kind of 
why markets are great, why prices are great, and um, what happens when they when they start failing.